me ask you a question, and you can be honest. Is that fair enough? Mm -hmm. yes. When's the last time you heard a sermon about Halloween? Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never. You know, I've been preaching for 40 years, and I've never preached a sermon about Halloween. So I said, you know, maybe it's time. I was reading about an Adventist church that was a new plant in their community and was getting near Halloween time and, and they thought maybe they could eradicate Halloween from their community. So their plan was to create a pamphlet about the history of Halloween and the evils of Halloween. And they passed them out through their entire neighborhood. Then they waited for responses. And boy, did they get responses. <laughs> they got a lot of angry phone calls and a lot of angry text messages. So the pastor said, well, maybe we need to try a different approach. So what he did, because what he would normally do is on Halloween, and probably many of you may do, is turn all his lights off, go to his bedroom, and listen to the doorbell ring. But he decided to make a special packet. And in that packet with what he considered healthy candy. I'm not sure what healthy candy is, but. And then he put a couple of small gifts and a small Bible. And everybody who came to his house got one of these packets. So I said, yeah, that's really a great idea. And so in our house, we give some candy and a pamphlet that uplifts Jesus Christ. And you should never know, I've never, I've never seen this one little kid, he's probably four years old, and he came to our house, got his candy, got his little pamphlet about Jesus, and he ran out, oh, he actually wasn't in the house with the front door, he turned around and he ran. And he said to his mother, and he lifted that pamphlet up, and he said, look what I got. He was more excited about that piece of pamphlet. He had no idea what the pamphlet was about, but he was so excited to get something besides just candy. And so I thought, well, I'm going to adventure. So let me ask you a question. In our setup, somehow I forgot to take the mirror off, so all my notes are missing. So, have you ever wondered why orange and black are the colors of Halloween? Have you ever wondered that? Well, pumpkins are orange, and that's why orange is one of the colors. But why the color black? Well, black is a symbol of darkness, the absence of God. And Halloween certainly is not a godly holiday, is it? Who loves Halloween? The stores do. You imagine $9.1 billion every year for Halloween? 9.1 means That means the average household spends $85 for Halloween. Someone's spending a lot more than I do. Because I don't even come close to that. And Halloween has a lot of customs, a lot of traditions. The jack-o'-lantern, trick-or-treating, costume, masks, ghost stories. Do you know where all that comes from? Well, the Celtics, which were from Europe, when they migrated to America, they brought the worship of the dead with them. That's what Halloween is, worship of the dead. They brought that with them. They believed that on October 31, the spirits of the dead would appear, either as a curse or as a blessing for next year's crop. So they were terrified of this date, October 31. And so on that date, they would put treats out on their doorsteps in hopes that the spirits would be pleased. But in case it was a bad spirit, they would dress up in scary costumes and hope to confuse the evil spirits. Now the sermon title is Paganism evolution and Adventism. So what is paganism? Well, it's a polytheistic or pantheistic nature of worshiping religion. 
you get that? Well, let's put it in English. Poly means many. Theistic means God. So it means the worship of many gods. And it is the worship of nature or the worship of creatures. Now, part of that paganism is pantheism. You know, it's been interesting in the history of our church that Satan has been on a war path against our church. And he's been trying to raise as many problems and crises as he could raise. And the Lord has had to respond to many of those crises. In the mid-1800s, or actually toward the later part of the 1800s, when the church was growing. One of the crises that arose was the no work. Now you remember the Apostle Paul had to address with the Thessalonians who believed that Jesus is coming soon, we don't need to work. And remember Paul said, you don't work, you don't eat. Then there was the holy flesh crisis that, that, that crept into the church. And that taught that if you accept Jesus and become a Seventh-day Adventist, you can never sin again. You never have to worry about it. So the Lord's servant had to address that issue. Pantheism. Before James White passed away, Dr. Harvey Kellogg, an Adventist doctor, came to them and said, I have new light. And Ellen White said to him, don't, don't speak of this. So the pan, she said, the pantheistic view, so earnestly advocated by some, Ellen White declared, would do away with God and, and invalidate the sanctuary truth. Kelly, I thought it was new truth, and he wanted to share it. And he did share it. She went on says, the pantheistic theories are not sustained by the word of God. The light of his truth shows that these theories are self-destroying agencies. You can see why she didn't want him to share it, but he did. And lastly, she said, darkness is their element. Sounds like Halloween, doesn't it? Darkness is their element. Sensuality, their sphere. They gratify the natural heart and give license to inclination. Separation from God is the result of accepting them. So you can see why she didn't want them to share this. But Ellen White said, remember this about the church. Because there's a lot of attacks that come to the church. But the church <coughs> enfeebled. But what does enfeebled mean? Yeah, we're not strong. We have problems, don't we? And I think that the Sabbath school lesson on unity in the church through Christ is really a very timely Sabbath school lesson. It says, the church enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned and counseled is the only object upon earth which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Isn't that encouraging? That despite all of our problems, Despite all of our pimples and our bumps and our disagreements, God loves this church. <coughs> and He's not going to give up on this church. When there are problems in the church, whether it be at the local level, conference level, division, or the general conference level, what we need to be doing is be on our knees praying for the leaders of our church to be sure they're following God's direction. Because the devil is after everybody. So when did the modern holiday get started in the U.S.? Well, the, the Celtics were from Europe. They migrated from Ireland and from Scotland. And they brought this form of worship with them. Now, these Celtics had, had a group called the Druids. They were the elite of the Celtics. And their celebration goes back 2,000 years, called Samhain. We call it Halloween, they call it Samhain. It was really 
the day of the dead. They sacrificed animals, plants, people. They honored the dead. And where did the name come from? Well, in the early 1600s, Boniface IV created the All Saints Day. You ever heard of the, all heard of the All Saints Day? It was May 13th when they would celebrate the honoring the dead. But in AD 700, Gregory III had moved All Saints Day to November 1. The reason they moved it was because the Celtics were having the worship of the dead October 31. Now, does October 31 mean anything special to us? Besides Halloween. The Re yes, the Reformation. Mm -hmm. October 31 is when Luther nailed his concerns to the church. But unfortunately, the mother church at that time, which that was the only church that existed, was trying to figure out how he would win these Celtics to Christ. But instead of the Celtics surrendering their beliefs, the church incorporated their beliefs so that Halloween and, and All Saints Days would come together and they would baptize the Celtics in their Halloween worships. So what does the Bible tell us happens when a person dies? Well, Karen and I took a few days of vacation and we went to Savannah. And I was, as I was listening, we were on one of those um, Charter, charter law. Tours. 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 And he would refer to someone having passed away and he would say he would be asleep. And I thought, I bet he doesn't know what he's really saying, but he's really got it right. But the dead are asleep. Notice Ecclesiastes 9.5, For the living know not that they will die. For the living know that they will die. But the dead know how much? Nothing. Nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. In Psalms 115, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down in silence. In Psalms 6, verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Aren't you glad that God, when a loved one dies, that they're laid to rest in the grave, that they're waiting, hopefully waiting for the resurrection to be with Christ, that first resurrection. Well, Carl read the scripture reading for us this morning in Genesis chapter 3. Remember the very first lie ever told? You will not surely die. And the world has bought into that. Most Christianity has bought into this lie. You will not surely die. You die, you go to heaven. And I've been to a lot of funerals, because as a pastor that makes sense. And I've attended a fair number of funerals. And usually when the pastor is preaching, uh, you die and go to hell. They always say you die and you go to heaven. I've never heard a pastor preach and say when you die, you go to hell. They don't do that, do they? It's because of this lie that Satan gave. You will not die. What is Genesis 2.17? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For on that day you eat of it, you shall what? Surely you shall surely die. What a tragedy that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They, they bought into Satan's lie that God was hiding something from them. Genesis 3.21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made them tunics of skin and clothed them. Because after Adam and Eve rebelled against God, that, that righteous glow that covered them disappeared. And what did they do? They hid and they sewed thick leaves together. That had to be incredibly uncomfortable. And so... A God who does not abandon us. He goes to them. And he makes the first sacrifice that would symbolize the ultimate sacrifice. But he clothed them with the skins of animals. And so we have that first sacrifice made for our parents. You know, God could have said, ah, let's start over. But he didn't. 
And as a result of their decision, we have crime, we have violence, we have suffering, we watch loved ones pass away, and people see tyrants destroying anybody who stays in their, stands in their way. And, and people cry out, God, why do you let these things happen? Why do you make these things happen? But remember, God did not make a sinful world. God did not make a sinful devil. He created Lucifer perfect. He created this world perfect. He created Adam and Eve perfect. His intention was for everything to be good. In fact, to be very good. But because of man's action, because of Adam's decision, sin came into the world. And with sin came death. If you look at Genesis chapter 5, you'll find one common word that runs through the entire genealogy. All these fathers, and of course mothers, were giving birth to the children. Those children all died. The reward of Adam's rebellion has been death. But God provided a sacrifice. Remember Genesis chapter 4. We have Cain and Abel offering their sacrifices. It says in Genesis 4, 3 through 5, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord. Now, was fruit and vegetables what God wanted? What was Cain trying to say? My way, yes. Save, I can, I can save myself. God said, no. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Because the Lord was trying to say in that first sacrifice, the only way mankind can be saved is from God's sacrifice. And those animals symbolize John 3.16. Then we have Noah offering his sacrifices in that boat for over 300 days, almost three, I think it's about 375 days, he comes out and then honoring God, taking the, some of the clean animals and begins to offer sacrifices. And then we have Abraham. Remember God asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And it was in that scene, just before Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his son, it was in that scene that the, that the universe, the angels, began to understand God's plan for, evolving, for resolving the sin problem. And that plan was his son, Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. <laughs> this thing here just cut the law. So it was written, first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became his being a life-giving spirit. Hebrews 9, 26. Then would they have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he, Jesus, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Isn't it wonderful that God loves us so much that he would make the infinite sacrifice Hebrews 9, 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We don't have the power to be righteous, but Christ who knew no sin has the power to transform us. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. All sin. God doesn't want us fretting and worried and, and stressed over our sins. He wants us to accept and to recognize that through the blood of Jesus Christ, 
God has forgiven our sins. We may come to the Lord and say, Lord, this is, I've done this same thing a thousand times. And the Lord says, what's well, news to me? Let's talk about it. Remember when Peter went to Jesus and he asked that question, Lord, how often should we forgive someone? Two times, three times. He said, I'll even be brave enough to say seven times. But what did Jesus say? Seven times seven, yes. Which is 490, not 490 times, 490 years. If you can forgive a person for 490 years, then you can say, okay, I'm done. Isn't that right? But let's look at the biblical view, the biblical worldview. God created a perfect world. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. And through Christ, God will restore the world. And so at the end of the millennium, when Jerusalem is brought, the new Jerusalem is brought to this earth, and the saints will be in the kingdom of God, there on earth, and the wicked will attack God's kingdom here on earth and be destroyed. Wouldn't that be amazing? After the end of a thousand years, after the end of the millennium, God will restore this earth back to the way it originally was. And what God longs to do today, though, is to restore a relationship between you and I every day. So what should our response be to Halloween? Two words, be discerning. Matthew 28, go therefore make disciples, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Our mission is to teach our families, our friends, our neighbors, anybody who will listen, to teach them about Jesus Christ. And to teach them all the things that he has taught us. To share in a kind, caring, and compassionate way. Amen. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear we somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by the, his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says there is the danger that we might be deceived. So we have to be discerning. We have to know the Word of God. We have to spend time with the Lord in prayer and in Bible study. We have to take those opportunities of sharing God's love. So there are two worldviews in our society. The one worldview is that God is in control. The other worldview is that man is in control. And when man is in control, it always makes a mess, doesn't it? So those two worldviews, Christianity and humanism. Christianity, we have the literal creation. Six or seven literal days, 24 hours, the creation. Humanism teaches the Big Bang. Now, the thing that's amazing about that, I remember as a little kid watching the, one of the Disney films about creation of the world and how this huge bang took place. But in humanism, no one can explain what caused the Big Bang. It just happened for some reason. But the Bible tells us that God created the world. He created man and woman. And on the seventh day, he rested from his work. He blessed the Sabbath. He sanctified the Sabbath. He set it aside. The Bible tells us about the fall of Adam and Eve. Man's worldview tells us that the world's been in existence for millions and millions of years. And that society began as you can as a one cell organism. It's no wonder we're such a mess that we began as a one cell organism. The Bible tells us about the flood, a worldwide destruction of sin. Man tells us no, it was an evolution, and all these sediments occurred over millions and millions of years. Science teaches that truth is observable and repeatable. When 
yet there's no evidence offered by evolutionists that that is true. We have secularism, which is life without God. We have atheism, which believes there is no God. And then there's new atheism. And new atheism teaches people that they should be evangel atheist evangelists. They go out and convert people to atheism. Then there's the non-religious. I don't know how many years this has been, been advocated, but people will say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Which means they do not buy into Christianity or they don't buy into religion. And maybe we shouldn't buy into religion, but we should buy into Christianity. We should buy into Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's naturalism and paganism. And really both those are any worldview deviating from God's world. And of course, paganism is probably the most common one that we see. Paganism is anything that teaches that God, you know, God is our worldview. And so, when you try to combine man's worldview and God's worldview, which gets modified? God's view, doesn't it? I remember reading about a pastor who went to visit one of the members, and she had a question, so he opened her Bible, and he said, Sister, what has happened to your Bible? All these pages are missing. He said, well, Pastor, you would be preaching that this is not true, and that's not true, and I just ripped the pages out. That's the problem with the worldview. It does not accept God as the infinite authority, and is constantly trying to modify. And probably the most popular modification is theistic evolution. Yes, there was a God who started things, but then he went on vacation and left us to ourselves. So what should be our response to evolution and to paganism? And against those same two words, we need to be discerning. Luke 21, 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Galatians 6, 7, and John 1, 6 all say the same. Take heed that you not be deceived. So if the counsel is take heed that you not be deceived, does that mean that we're in the danger of being deceived? Absolutely. And how do we avoid being deceived? Pardon? Studying the word. Studying the word. No, not. Spending time with the word. <laughs> Spending time in prayer. Be not deceived. This is the world view. The Single cell, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, apes, and then man. I'm so glad that is not the biblical view. Now when we talk about the tree of life, there's also the mist in the garden and the tree of knowledge with you. When we talk about the tree of life and the multiple fruits that are on there, the tree that will be in heaven, isn't that a grand, grand picture that God is painting for us? But when the evolutionists and the paganists are talking about the tree of life, this is their tree of life. It really is a tree of death, not a tree of life. <laughs> Notice Proverbs 8.36, But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me do what? They love death. Now that's an odd concept, isn't it? Can you imagine loving death? Now, if the way to heaven is to die and go to heaven, then I guess you would love death. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that when we die, we sleep until Jesus comes. Carl Sagan, an evolutionist, said, the secret of evolution are time 